Good afternoon. It's certainly good to see everybody here today. Um, welcome to the Inspector General Seminar. My name is Ed Hartman, DAV's Inspector General, and I'm joined by Brian Coart, our Chief uh, uh, Development Officer, and Laura Rushi, who is our DAV 5K uh, Series Manager. Um, we're going to kind of tag team this seminar into a couple different aspects. I'm going to give you a little bit of information on uh, my world or as it relates to the Inspector General and what we can all be doing as chapters and departments and members to safeguard DAV assets um, so that we all wind up uh, uh, really making sure that we are protecting the funds that are being provided to us by the American people because at the end of the day we have to remember that when money is donated to DAV, it's not our money, it's the donor's money. They've simply entrusted us as an organization to provide those funds uh, in a manner that is specific to their wishes, and that's providing service to veterans and their families. One thing I always like to do before um, we get started in any meeting, and that's just to remind everybody of DAV's mission statement. Um, I do this for a couple of reasons, because it sets the tone of our meeting, why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing as an organization. Each and every time we gather, whether that's at a chapter meeting, a department meeting, or even a national meeting, uh, this kind of sets the tone in terms of what we should be discussing and talking about, because I'm sure that many of us have been in chapter meetings and unit meetings and department meetings where it seems like everything that comes up on the floor has absolutely positively nothing to do with our mission statement, but rather something that is of personal interest to us uh, and really has no place in being discussed and, and uh, decided during the course of a DAB meeting. So bear with me just one moment and I'll read DAB's mission statement to uh, each and every one of you. And of course, these are found within our Constitution and bylaws. But we are dedicated to a single purpose, and that is empowering veterans to lead high-quality lives with respect and dignity. We accomplish this by making sure veterans and their families can access the full range of benefits available to them, fighting for the interests of America's injured heroes on Capitol Hill, and educating the public about the great sacrifices and needs of veterans transitioning back to civilian life. How do we do that? We do that by providing free professional assistance to veterans and their families in, in obtaining benefits and services earned throughout their military service um, and provided by the Department of Veterans Affairs and other agencies of government, providing outreach concerning its programs and services to the American people generally and to disabled veterans and their families specifically, representing the interests of disabled veterans, their families, their widowed spouses, and their orphans before Congress, the White House, and the judicial branch, as well as state and local government, extending DAV's mission of hope into the communities where these veterans and their families live through a network of state-level departments and local chapters and providing a structure through which disabled veterans can express their compassion for their fellow veterans through a variety of volunteer programs. So in a nutshell, that's what each and every one of us as a DAV member should be interested in first and foremost when we attend any DAV function, whether it be at the chapter level, department uh, uh, level, or at the national level. These are all things that we need to keep uh, uh, in the forefront and uh, in our mind first as we go about our business. So today, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we really want to spend a little bit of time discussing uh, this afternoon is protecting DAV assets. Now, uh, this has really, um, it's not been a huge issue that we've had to address during the last year, but it's been um, significant enough that we feel that it's important for us to address just to give some tools to each and every one of you of, as leaders within your chapters and departments on best practices of how to safeguard DAV assets from theft or conversion. And that is something that is required of us by our bylaws in Article 14, Section 14.9. Um, it's our responsibility as departments and chapters to protect DAV assets from theft or conversion. 
This responsibility includes, without limitation, implementation of sound financial management practices and the purchase of insurance to cover theft and losses. So the question is, what is the implementation of sound financial management practices? And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in this next slide and some tools that you can go back and use within your chapter and department to make sure that uh, all of DAV's assets are protected. So. As you can see, the very first bullet point up there is handling cash. Now, we're very fortunate as an organization that we don't have to handle cash on a, um, on a daily basis, but we do, on occasion, have the opportunity and the need to handle cash, whether that's during forget-me-not drives, whether that's during Golden Corral drives. Thank you. Um, or any other time where we are provided cash that is intended for DAV. Um, one of the biggest, that's, that's a lot louder, isn't it? All right, I'm gonna try to back it up here a little bit. Um, when handling cash, and I'm gonna try to make this a little interactive as well. Back down a little bit? All right. So Blas, maybe it wasn't just your hearing aids. <laughs> So when handling cash, just like uh, any other uh, asset, um, is it wise, and, and again, I'm gonna try to make this a little interactive, so I'm gonna ask some questions of you uh, during the course of the presentation. Is it wise for one person and one person only to be entrusted with handling the cash of the organization and being responsible for counting all the money? You're absolutely right, because the temptation is there in some instances where, you know, a dollar for DAV, dollar for me, dollar for DAV, dollar for me. So a good practice to get into is any time that you have the need to handle cash, always make sure that you've got at least two members that are doing that, that can um, not only ensure that we're counting money correctly, but uh, also to keep everybody honest. Not that we're not honorable people, uh, not that we don't have a high degree of integrity, but it just prevents the opportunity for somebody to do something that might be tempting to them. And in many cases where we have, uh, in the rare cases, found theft of DAV assets, whether it be at the chapter level or department level, it's always been because one person has single sole access to either cash uh, or, in some cases, uh, checking account funds. So when we talk about having two people um, handling cash, counting cash, accounting for cash, here's another question for you. Is it wise to have a, uh, two brothers or a husband and a wife um, serving as those two people? You're right, and you know, you've heard the old saying that sometimes bad, or apples don't fall too far from the tree or fall uh, far from the tree, so um, there are often times when even though there are two people handling cash, um, you know, that's not a safety net or a guarantee that everything is going to happen appropriately. Uh, sometimes people collude, and especially when they're uh, family members, um, you know, there's a need for whatever reason in their own household or with their own family for money, so they kind of collude to uh, ensure that, or not to ensure, but to uh, deceive and, and hide monies from the chapter that they end up ultimately sticking in their pocket. And again, by mention of this, this isn't something that is widespread in any DAV entity, but it's happened uh, a handful of times throughout the course of the last year that it's really important that we at least talk about this because at the end of the day, and if you listen to the uh, business session this morning during Executive Director Barry Jezinoski's report, our name is everything to us and having a very high level of integrity and a very high level of transparency with the American public has allowed us not only continue as an organization in, in the coming years, but has served us well in almost 100 years of our history. And so the more transparent that we are, the more accountability that we have with the American public, 
and the higher uh, level of integrity that we have as an organization is going to ensure that we as an organization at all levels are going to be there well into the future taking care of the next generation of disabled veterans and their family. Um, depositing money. Um, so now you've got two people that have counted the money, everything is uh, uh, accounted for, both people's agree, or both individuals agree that uh, we, we've come up with $525. Next step is to get that into the bank right away, right? We don't want to take it home with us and hold it in our pocket, um, you know, because we're going to go to the bank in the next two weeks, so we'll just make the deposit then. Get the money deposited right away. Uh, any number of things can happen. Um, we've had individuals that have been mugged or robbed. Uh, it, it's not happened so much this year, but uh, there have been examples in the last uh, couple of years where veterans out collecting monies for their chapter on Forget Me Not Drives have actually been mugged from the time that they've collected their mu uh, funds in a bucket and made their way to a car, or they had a very, very successful Forget Me Not Drive, so they had to take a full bucket of money, put it in their car, go back with another bucket, and, and spend the rest of the day collecting money in another bucket. So people are always watching and observing, and people who want to do bad things are going to take advantage of an opportunity to uh, really, uh, I don't want to say prey upon veterans, but uh, they, people in the community see what DAV is doing, they see how much money is being collected, and they'll certainly take any opportunity they can to uh, steal from disabled veterans and their families. So in addition to collecting the money, counting the money, let's get the money in the bank right away so that there's no lost funds, uh, there's no opportunity for somebody other than the DAV member or the treasurer to get access to those funds and otherwise steal them. No commingling of funds, kind of getting along uh, or uh, right in line with depositing the funds. We should never take DAV assets and deposit them in our own personal checking account for safeguarding. Um, now, there's been the argument, well, the chapter's bank is 30 miles away, but yet I've got a bank here in my own town. It's better sitting in my account where I can simply write a check to the chapter at the next chapter meeting and then have those monies deposited in, in the account. You know what, I mean, in reality, I mean, that makes perfect sense as long as everybody knows how much money went in, how much money's coming out, how much money's going back into the chapter account. But perception-wise, you don't want to give anybody the opportunity to allege that you as a well-intended DAV member has done anything nefarious to uh, hide or steal funds from DAV. And so that's just a, uh, um, a common sense way of, of preventing that. When you have money, make sure it gets in DAV's account right away. Um, in addition, other organizations, we shouldn't be depositing DAV funds into other organizations' accounts. I know that many of us here in this room uh, serve not only as active members of DAV, but as active members of other organizations like the Legion or the VFW or any other number of organizations. We should never deposit any DAV funds in the accounts of other organizations for the purpose of, of convenience in, in, until we're able to get those funds deposited into a DAV account. So no commingling of funds with, uh, of DAV funds into another organization. Um, Loans and grants to other organizations. This is really two different things, but uh, I kind of grouped them together into the same bullet point. Um, you know, our bylaws are very specific that we as an organization should not be providing loans to members, other organizations. I mean, we're not a banking institution. Uh, many times throughout the course of the year, I get telephone calls from DAB chapters that say, you know, hey, we loaned uh, $5,000 to member A because he or she needed, uh, you know, to make a, an emergent repair or they had to go on a trip and it wasn't a grant, it was a loan and they promised to pay us back. Well, they don't pay it back, uh, the chapter's out of money and the only other recourse that the chapter has at that point is to take the individual to small claims court to try to recover the funds that were loaned to them. 
Um, when we're talking about giving grants to other organizations, remember what I mentioned earlier about DAV monies that are held in DAV accounts really isn't DAV money, but it's the American public's money because they've entrusted us to uh, put that money to work for disabled veterans and their families. When they find out that we're giving grants or loans to other organizations, um, their very next uh, uh, mindset or their very next idea or thought is, why am I giving money to DAV because they're not spending it in the manner in which I intended my donation to be spent for. They're giving it to another organization, they're loaning it to uh, the church, they're loaning it to the Boy Scouts of America, the Girl Scouts. So we have a, an obligation to spend the money that's provided to us by donors to provide service to disabled veterans and their families only. And of course, a lot of times, it boils down to common sense. Um, when we have assets, I mean, we have any number of programs in DAV, especially at the chapter level, where we have an urgent need to provide direct assistance relief to veterans in our communities, right? Whether that's paying a utility bill because the electricity is about to be turned off, whether that is um, making uh, uh, an emergency repair on a veteran's uh, vehicle because now he or she as is in jeopardy of losing their ability to make their way to their job to provide for their family. Um, when we do that, and, and again, that's all very well and noble, um, but when we do that, we need to make sure that, A, we have the authority from our chapter by way of a vote to expend those funds for that purpose. And secondly, if it's approved by the body to make that financial distribution, we should do that by way of check made payable to, in many cases, the utility company or the actual, uh, if it's in the instance of a car repair, to the uh, uh, repair facility that is making the repair. Um, last thing that we want to do is provide somebody with cash or make a check directly payable to a veteran where they're going to utilize that money for anything other than the intended purpose for which they came to us asking for our assistance and then we provided the assistance. So uh, always make sure that the checks that are being made out uh, for Veterans Relief is made payable to the entity that it's due, whether it's a utility company, whether it's a, an apartment complex for past due rent, they're about to be evicted. Uh, never provide cash. A, because you don't know that for sure that that money is going to be spent uh, uh, for the intended purpose. And then also, it's very, very, very difficult to track in terms of um, a donation made on behalf of a chapter. Whereas if you provide a check, you've got a canceled check that now you can prove to anybody um, that may question where that money went. In, in particular, the Internal Revenue Service, which we're gonna talk about here in just a little bit, that yes, we did make this uh, contribution to this individual for this very particular purpose. Um, one of the other um, things that we see in terms of, in, in a common sense thing is gift cards. Um, you know, it's, especially around the holidays, it's very, very common for DAB chapters, departments to go out and buy a whole slew of $100 gift cards that you know, we're gonna make available to needy veterans and their families so that they can help provide for their families over the holidays or at the beginning of the school year. We have to treat those, cre those uh, uh, gift cards much like we would cash. So we should never have one person responsible for holding on to 50 $100 gift cards and just distributing it at will. Uh, and I'll use a very common example of, of what has happened in the past, and we certainly, certainly want to take all steps that we can to eliminate the opportunity for this happening again in the future is, um, you know, well, hey, I'm the commander. I spend a lot of time over at the VA Medical Center. I spend a lot of time down at the Homeless Veterans Shelter. I spend a lot of time over at the State Veterans Nursing Home. Give me all those 50 $100 gift cards, and I'll hand them out, you know, whenever I'm making my rounds throughout the course of the month. Um, and in many cases, you know, they're, they're used for their very specific pur purpose, but um, 
a few times it's been discovered and it's been brought to our attention and um, we've had to try to find ways to recover this money. Um, those 50 $100 gift cards were used by that one individual to buy their groceries, go to Walmart, buy their clothes, so on and so forth. So much like cash, at the end of the day, gift cards are cash, right? Because you can redeem it for anything. Um, so we just have to make sure that we have proper checks and balances in place um, in the instance of, of distributing gift cards. Uh, best way to do that would probably have a committee. Uh, make the individual that is seeking the assistance come into the chapter, come, whether it's, if, if your chapter is fortunate enough to have a building or at your next chapter meeting, hey, our chapter meeting is next, next week, come into the chapter, uh, tell us what you need, and we'll, we'll help you out. But we've got to have some documentation as to what your need is so that we can provide some relief to you. So gift cards are just like cash. In addition to uh, all the things we just talked about in terms of uh, sound financial management practices, um, how many of you have been to a chapter meeting and it's been a matter of whenever it comes time for the treasurer's report, the treasurer stands up and says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got $5,000 in the bank. We spent $100 last month. We brought in $200 for forget-me-not. Our balance is $5,100 at the end of this month. And then that's all the explanation that's provided. That happens. I know, I know there's some hands that are going to have to go up, right? That happens often, right? Um, it, it's our responsibility to ask questions. So even though the treasurer might be spot on with his accounting and his or her um, uh, explanation of where the money is, how much money we have in the bank, and how much money was spent, and how much money was brought in, but show us. Show us the bank statements. Um, because other times where we've identified um, a laxed policy within the chapter where funds have wound up missing, it's typically been where the membership wasn't active enough to ask very specific pointed questions and requiring the treasurer to provide not only a treasurer's report, but provide us with a line by line item of where the money went, how it came in, and oh, by the way, show us the bank statement that matches up with what you just told us. Um, just to use an example, uh, and I don't know how in the world they ever thought they were going to get away with it, but you know, a treasurer would uh, give the financial report, and uh, in in this particular instance, um, you know, claimed that the chapter had twenty thousand dollars in the bank and all is well. And then the very next year, the treasurer was no longer elected as the treasurer. Now the new treasurer steps in, finds out that there's no money in the bank that the treasurer has cleaned it out, but yet continued to tell the chapter that we still have all this money. So uh, by being um, wise and educated DAB members, we should certainly always make sure that we ask questions, especially those that are related to the finances of the organization to ensure that all of our funds are accounted for and not just taking someone's word for it. Every time that this instance happens, um, you know, the very first thing that's said to me is, man, I really thought we could trust him. He's been the treasurer for 10 years and I never would have thought he would have done something like that. So um, let's just do our best to, to keep people honest and certainly ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, that's the, the, our obligation as members is to ask questions. So know where the money's located, know where the bank is. Um, and another example in, in, uh, along the same lines is um, there are sometimes chapters that have multiple checking accounts, and, but yet the chapter is only aware of one checking account or savings account. So always make sure that you know where DAB's assets are being maintained uh, in, in which bank so that uh, we know what is happening with DAB assets. 
vouchers. Um, we all travel. We're all here attending DAB's convention, and I know that many of us here in this room are here as delegates uh, of our chapter and probably receiving some form of reimbursement, if not full reimbursement, of the expenses that are incurred, whether it's airline, housing, meals, travel, or otherwise, for our participation here at the National Convention. Um, when we get back, we've got to account for all those funds. So nobody should be getting more money than what they are otherwise entitled or authorized to spend by the chapter coming to a convention, whether it's a national convention, department convention, uh, or in any other business activities, official business activities of DAB. Um, so vouchers are very, very, very important. And again, um, getting back to the IRS, that's something that uh, when we start talking about the IRS, I think in the next uh, couple slides, um, that is really going to be helpful to each and every one of you as chapter leaders and departments to validate what your chapter or department is doing in terms of your expenditures. Of course, receipts are very important that go along with those vouchers. Uh, we, can't, um, we can't justify making a payment to an individual who simply said, well, yeah, my room was $200 a night and I was there for five days. Um, provide the receipt, and if you provide a properly or, or provide a receipt and a properly completed voucher, you know you're entitled to that reimbursement uh, for those expenditure of DAB assets. Um, we were talking about proper approval. Everybody knows before you know you come to a national convention or a department convention, who's going to be a delegate, who's going to be authorized to travel as an official representative of a chapter or a department to a convention. So as a part of that approval process, the discussion needs to be had, how much are we going to um, provide to our delegates at DAB's expense for the purpose of attending this event? Are we gonna pay for all of the airfare, all of the room, all of the meals up to a certain amount? Um, so that the individual that's actually attending knows what to expect whenever they get back in terms of reimbursement. Many times we'll have issues right after a national convention especially where delegates will come back to the chapter and realize that they were only authorized $500 in total for their trip as a delegate to the national convention, but yet they spent $850. Now they're out $350 of their own money. And again, they were thinking that they had full reimbursement of all those expenses. So um, know what the body has approved in terms of travel um, as a delegate to the National Convention or Department Convention or in any other activity. A lot of us are chapter service officers, department service officers, so we have, we have expenses that uh, um, we have to incur, maybe even individually, uh, in hopes of getting or with the expectation that we're going to re be reimbursed by the chapter or department for our expenses. Um, before you spend DAB money, know that you're going to be uh, authorized to get reimbursement for those funds prior to spending it. And my, my uh, uh, motto has always been in the 23 years that I've been with DAB is, you know, spend DAV money as if it's your own. So, you know, don't go out and, you know, get that uh, $75 filet mignon uh, because DAV's paying for it. Um, uh, you know, treat it as if it, you, it was your own because, um, you know, we need to make sure that, that we're spending DAV funds appropriately. Now, it's, it's, not uncommon, you know, we always talk about DAB monies being spent solely for the purpose of providing service to disabled veterans and their families. Now, your participation and your presence here is really a service because whether you're attending the one of the business sessions or one of the many seminars that you are participating in, you're being, you're taking back a wealth of knowledge that is going to help you and the organization fulfill its mission in your community. So, um, that's an easily justifiable expense in terms of uh, DAV assets. Um, when it comes to checks, um, always make sure that there are two signatures on a check. I, I can tell you that I review a fair amount of constitution and bylaws from chapters and departments that come in for 
approval by the national judge advocate and 99.9% um, .9 of the Constitution and bylaws that come in have that requirement that all checks for distributions have two signatures and it's usually the treasurer's signature and the commander's uh, signature and in the absence of the commander, the senior vice commander or another line officer of the chapter or department. But again, that's just, uh, that's uh, keeping people honest, making sure that DAV funds are being spent appropriately. Um, now just because it requires dual signatures, should we ever find ourselves in the practice where at a chapter meeting, um, the treasurer says, hey, commander, I've got, I'm expecting five bills to come due in the next month. We just go ahead and sign this blank check for me so that all I have to do is fill it out later and sign the name. Yeah. Right, because once your signature's on there, you are responsible for whatever he makes it out for and whatever amount um, he makes it out for. So no pre-signed checks. Um, you know, this is all a matter of checks and balances and, and implementing sound uh, financial practices that you know we would otherwise use in our own personal um, uh, lives and our own personal finances. I would never sign a check, a blank check, and give it to Brian Cohort because I know Brian likes motorcycles. <laughs> so I might uh, be surprised at the end of the month that Brian went out and used my pre-signed check to buy a new Harley. Just and and you know I say that jokingly, but. I'm here to tell you it happens and you know we have 1300 chapters in this country and 52 state departments so uh, you know it's not widespread it's not uh, 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 not uh, widely an issue but it does in fact happen so uh, any instance of those things happening is is one too many um, the next slide is talking about credit cards and or debit cards. Um, credit cards and debit cards are, they're cash. Those are DAV assets that are, that belong to the chapter, belong to the department, and they are really, really, really not encouraged to have. There's no provision in the bylaws that says you can't have them, but when you have one person who has a DAV issued credit card, uh, there's always the temptation um, to utilize that card for something that is needed, uh, whether it's intentional, whether it's on, in ac on an accident, but um, there's, there's uh, been a, an increase in the number of issues where a department issued credit card or a chapter issued credit card has been used inappropriately, whether it's for, you know, stopping and filling up my gas tank uh, every other week or using it to do all my shopping at Sam's Club. Um, so the best way to avoid that or prevent that is to really get out of the practice if you do have credit cards or debit cards, getting away from those because Really, if you think about it, there's absolutely, and I know that we live in an electronic age where credit cards are used for everything. Um, but we as individuals, I mean, if you've got a checking account, there's a almost 100% chance that you've got a debit card that's associated with that checking account. Um, so if we're coming to a national convention, a department convention, we know we're coming. We know we've been elected as a delegate to represent our chapter at a department convention or a national convention. Um, we might not have the personal funds on our own to foot the bill up front and then wait until the next month to get reimbursed by the chapter or the department for our travels. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the chapter or the department to provide an advance to the delegate attending the department convention or national convention so that when they check in the hotel, they've got their debit card, that debit card's got those funds in there that they can uh, use for the purpose of their room, their airline ticket, their meals, whatever that is. Um, and then at the end, of the end of the event, you come back, you complete a voucher, um, you know how much money was spent, and in some cases, you might have to give some money back to the chapter because you didn't spend all the money. Uh, in some cases, the chapter might owe you a little bit more money. 
but everyone has a debit card or a credit card, so we should really get into the practice of using our own debit card or credit card for DAV business with the thought and the intent and the plan that whenever the event is over, I'm gonna take all my receipts, I'm gonna complete a voucher, I'm gonna present it to the chapter, I'm gonna present it to the department for reimbursement. And again, uh, we all might not have the ability to do that. That's why it's very important that as chapters and departments that we offer the opportunity for our delegates to get advances well before the convention so that when they come, they have the peace of mind knowing that I have money in my account that is tied to my debit card that I can uh, come to the convention and not have to worry about it. Uh, accurate financial reports. Um, as we all know, um, we have updated the annual financial report and the schedules that uh, are required of departments and, and chapters uh, starting this year. So if you haven't already started working on your chapter or department uh, annual financial report, you really should be within the next uh, couple of weeks because those are of course due September 30th. Um, when you elect or appoint a committee to validate those annual financial reports, if you are elected or selected to serve on the committee to validate the annual financial report, you should never just sign your name. So in other words, when you certify that you've reviewed that annual financial report, you're certifying and signing your name that everything on this annual financial report is correct and accurate. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where we get an annual financial report and we have questions, something looks questionable in terms of expenses and where monies may be, where they have gone, um, that we'll call the, the committee members and say, you know, hey, can you explain to us the rationale of why there's $5,000 listed as uh, expenses to homeless and needy veterans whenever you can only show documentation to support $1,000 of that? Most of the time we get the reply from the audit committee members, well, I, I didn't look at it, I just signed my name to it. So, um, it's again, getting back to our own individual responsibility as as engaged members at the chapter level, the department level, to ask questions. And if we're on the audit committee for those financial reports, we should be looking at the bank statements, the receipts, the vouchers, the expenditures, and making sure that when we sign our name as an audit committee member, that we fully believe and understand that the um, funds that we're reporting as income and expenses are in fact what they are. We talked about um, purchasing insurance for, you know, to cover uh, losses. And whenever I talk about losses, they might be um, uh, physical losses like a building or a property. If we own property or a building as a chapter or department, we should certainly, even though we might not have a mortgage on it, we should certainly make sure that we have the appropriate insurance in place to cover that property uh, in the event of a tornado, a flood, or some other kind of vandalism or damage or a fire. Um, because at the end of the day, that DAV building is a DAV asset, right? Because DAV funds were used to acquire, build um, that property. So in order to do that, make sure that you work with a uh, local insurance provider or a national insurance provider to make sure that all of DAV assets are covered from loss. Uh, we talked about buildings and property. There's also a policy that can be provided and purchased at a very, very uh, low premium to cover the chapter or the department for losses related to theft of DAV assets. It's called a, I think it's called a DNO policy or a directors and officers policy. Um, this will basically uh, cover and ensure DAV assets from theft or loss by way of some kind of nefarious act by an individual, whether they just outright uh, stole the money, embezzled the money, um, laundered the money through some other source. Uh, it's a very, very 
uh, inexpensive policy to have and certainly is one that if you have a chapter that has any uh, amount of money should be interested in, in getting. Simple, simple way to do that, we have a carrier that we work with in Cincinnati that has been providing these policies to chapters and departments across the country. We can certainly make a recommendation to you if you're interested in, in acquiring that kind of a coverage. Uh, all you have to do is give us a call, we'll put you in touch with them, or you can simply reach out to any local, um, even a mom and pop shop will provide DNO policy for you in terms of insurance. So, uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, we have an obligation to the Internal Revenue Service, and if you've been attending my seminars, whether it's at National Convention or at Midwinter Conference over the years, you'll know that I've really been uh, harping the last three or four years on the completion of the IRS Form 990. Uh, the IRS. I think it was in 2012 or 2013, changed the law that required that each and every nonprofit organization, with the exception of religious uh, entities, have to file some kind of IRS Form 990 um, to validate their expenses and income as an organization. Um, most chapters in the country fall into the category of, of being required to file a 990N, otherwise known as an electronic postcard on the IRS website. So basically, if your chapter had less than $50,000 of income during our accounting period, which runs from July 1st to June 30th of the following year, the only obligation that you have with the Internal Revenue Service as it relates to a 990 is logging on to the IRS website and filling out a 990N, which takes about three minutes. Uh, all you need to complete that is the employer identification number for your chapter or your unit, uh, and then enter the name of the responsible individual, which is usually the treasurer of the, uh, of the organization, and then hit submit. And when you hit submit, you're validating and certifying to the Internal Revenue Service that your entity, your chapter, your unit, had less than $50,000 of income, and that's all you have to do. Um, if you don't um, provide those IRS Form 990s, after three consecutive years of non-compliance and non-submittal of those 990s, the IRS is gonna send you a very nice letter that says, you know, hey, DAV Chapter 1, um, we're unfortunately uh, notifying you that you've lost your tax exemption with the Internal Revenue Service and so now you are no longer considered a tax-exempt organization able to collect money from the general public on a, on a, uh, uh, as a tax-exempt organization. When that happens, uh, many things happen. Uh, of course, we all know as chapters we get dues distributions from the national organization based upon the size of our membership each and every year. Um, we put those on hold right away because when you lose that tax exemption, any money that comes into the name of the organization, you now have to pay a tax on it. And it's usually a very sizable tax. So when we place a hold on it, and, you know, many of you who are very active, especially in your, in your chapters and you're constantly looking at the membership system to look at the status or look at the officer report or look at your membership ship strength of your chapter, you might see the notation on hold. On hold just simply means that we are holding all distributions that are, that are otherwise supposed to be coming to you for the sole purpose of allowing you the opportunity to get your tax exempt status back. And then once you get that tax exempt status back, all of those funds that we've been holding for you will provide to you in one lump sum and then, of course, continue to make those distrib uh, distributions year after year. Because the last thing we want to do is give you $10,000 in dues distributions and then have you uh, need to turn around and issue $4,000 of that to the Internal Revenue Service. 
So our kind of an indirect, anybody work for the IRS in here? All right, good, good, because I'm going to let you know a secret. The reason we do that, obviously, is we, we just simply hold it, and we maintain it in our account, and then once you get your tax-exempt status back, we make that distribution to you in full so that you don't have to otherwise pay tax on it. Not that that's illegal. Um, just wanted to make sure that uh, there was nobody here from the Internal Revenue Service that was going to say, aha, I need to go back and work on legislation to, to correct that. Um, so when you lose your tax exemption, um, it's a long, painful process to get that tax exempt status back. Anybody out there in the past, not because of your own fault or it might have been an officer before you didn't file those 990s and you wound up losing your tax exemption, it's no fun trying to get it back. Um, in many cases, it takes well over a year um, there's a lot of time spent on the telephone with IRS agents. There's a lengthy IRS form 1024 that needs to be completed. There are fees that are associated with it. So the best way to do it is to simply make sure that each and every year we're filing those 990s. And, in, and again, in many cases, it's simply a matter of spending three minutes online and filing that 990 in or that electronic postcard. Um, when your, un when your entity is on hold and we're holding those distributions for you uh, that would otherwise be coming to you, we can't allow that entity to go out and do any form of fundraising. So forget me not drives, Golden Corral events, anything else that the chapter would otherwise be involved with in terms of fundraising, you have to put on hold because now, again, any income that comes into the chapter is now taxable. So as an organization of DAV, we can't allow any entity to go out, raise money in the name of DAV, and claim that, you know, hey, your taxes or your donation is tax deductible and um, end up having to turn around and spend a large portion of that donation to pay taxes to the federal government. Um, those of you who have been around for a number of years, when we, the very first year that we were hit with a big long laundry list of, of chapters and a few departments that lost their tax exemption, we'll remember that that one particular year we had about 178 chapters that lost their tax exemption all at once. Um, we've gotten much better over the years by way of working with departments, communicating with chapters. Uh, about these 990s that I'm happy to report that this year, as of last month, in, last, uh, in June is when they typically release the listing of organizations that have lost their tax exemption. We only had 25. So we're making a lot of progress in, in informing people of the 990s. So this year we've only got 25 that lost their tax exemption, but that's 25 chapters that are gonna now have to go through that long, arduous process of applying for tax exemption, getting their money back, uh, getting their tax exemption back, and uh, just jumping through those hoops. I know that there are many departments uh, out there that um, have been very, very helpful to the chapters within their state that they'll do the 990 for them. Again, because it's such a quick, and simple process that if the chapter needs help, all they have to do is reach out to the department and the departments uh, will gladly, in most cases, log on, spend the time, and um, fill out that 990 for you. Um, matter of fact, many of them have written into their bylaws that any chapter under $50,000 during the course of the year that the department will go ahead and do that for you just to save the chapters a little bit of work. So, this next slide, IRS audits, they're coming. Um, and this is just a byproduct of when they changed the law in 2013 where all of these nonprofit organizations are now required to file a 990. That opens up the door for them to cherry pick randomly, I don't know how they randomly do it, but DAV entities and I'm sure other uh, nonprofit organizations to audit. Um, this year is the very first time that we're aware that DAV entities have been contacted by the Internal Revenue Service for the purpose of conducting an audit. Um, 
there was a chapter and, and even one department that uh, has um, been audited this year. So we don't know what to expect in the future, but the only way that um, we can plan for them is to prepare for them, make sure that we have the appropriate documentation that we're going to need as an organization um, to provide to the Internal Revenue Service to validate what we're doing as an organization, validate our income, validate our expenses. Um, so what are, what are some of the things that we're gonna need to keep on hand uh, for the purposes of an IRS audit? Much like the documentation that you would use whenever you file your own taxes. Any uh, large gift um, information, if you get a, uh, a grant from a state organization or a state government or the county government, um, make sure that you keep that gifting letter that accompanies it saying, hey, congratulations, we're giving DAB Chapter 1 this grant of $5,000 to help veterans in their community. Likewise, any time that we make a donation or a distribution for a particular program that's gonna benefit disabled veterans and their families, we need a receipt for that distribution. Uh, and that's one of the things that are required now in the new annual financial reports. Um, not only to make uh, life easier for everybody to validate where our monies are going, but also to protect the chapter or the department in the case that they are audited in the future, that you know when you make a donation to like the VABS program, we all have VABS programs in most of our states, most of our departments that we support many times by way of a cash donation um, or to a state veterans nursing home. That's all well and good. And that's a justifiable, legitimate service expenditure that we can validate all day long to anybody that we're spending money on service programs to veterans and their families. But the one thing that we have been a little laxed on doing is requiring the recognition letter from the entity that we're given the gift to. So much like we would do on our own personal um, taxes, if I make a donation to DAV, DAV is gonna send me a letter recognizing my gift, notifying me that it's tax deductible and I can offset my taxes. Uh, we need to require that same documentation from the entity that we're giving the gift to so that we can uh, validate to the Internal Revenue Service that this is where that money went. Um, and that's just for gifts. So uh, we talked about travel and vouchers and receipts earlier, right? So any expenses that we have as an organization, we need to keep uh, financial records of those uh, transactions as well. So uh, not only for the purposes of providing our annual financial report each and every year, but also more importantly, being able to justify to the Internal Revenue Service our expenses if we are audited in the future. So. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we expect that over the next several years we'll see more and more DAV entities being audited, and the best way to prepare for that is to keep good records and make sure that we maintain those records for the IRS recommendation is seven years. So I know I get a lot of phone calls from chapters and departments asking, you know, well, how long are we required to keep records for? How long are we required to keep min uh, minutes from our meetings for? And I always use the, IR the IRS standard of seven years. One of the other things that um, we've had to address with the Internal Revenue Service over the last year, and again, this would be something that would be a red flag for the Internal Revenue Service if they were to audit a department or a chapter is where are your W-2s, where are your 1099s for your employees? Um, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand because I don't want you to identify that you're doing something wrong, but um, um, I know that there are chapters, I know that there are departments that give stipends to individuals, whether they are officers of the chapter, or officers of the department. Stipends are compensation, it's pay. Um, 
when you have a stipend that you're providing to an individual, that stipend has to be accompanied by a, an IRS form 1099 at the end of the year because that individual that is receiving that stipend, that income, that compensation is responsible for paying taxes on that. So as an individual, it's in our best interest if we're getting that stipend that we get a 1099 because if we personally get audited, you know, we're gonna have to validate you know, that income and of course pay tax on that income. But as an organization, we could certainly also get dinged if we're found to be providing stipends to individuals that we're not issuing 1099s for um, that alerts the Internal Revenue Service that, hey, John Doe has received a $20,000 stipend from Chapter A and therefore be on alert that John Doe should be reporting that on his uh, uh, IRS uh, tax filings. So the key thing to remember um, with 1099s, if it's a stipend or if it's an, a non-employee that is in some way, shape, or form getting a stipend, a gift, or otherwise in the amount of $600 or more during the course of the year, a 1099 must be issued uh, to the Internal Revenue Service and the individual. Of course, any active employee of the department um, would otherwise get a W-2, just like we all do in our own normal lives as uh, being employees of an organization or a company. Um, now there's a difference between stipends and reimbursement. Um, stipends is, is just basically a gift saying, hey, we're giving you this money because we know you're gonna have some expenses during the course of the year um, and we want you to have this up front to make life a little bit easier for you. Um, that's a lot different than uh, reimbursement for expenses. So using again the example of coming to convention, you might get a thousand dollars from your chapter or a thousand dollars from your department that you're spending here conducting official DAB business. That's not included in the six hundred dollar or more figure because you're basically being paid to travel for the business of the organization and in many cases you're being reimbursed you're being reimbursed for expenses that are directly coming out of your pocket. So 1099s, if it's a gift, a stipend, anything else, um, direct reimbursement for expenses that you're being provided for official DAB activities is not included in that $600 amount for the purposes of it issuing, for issuing a 1099. Um, at this point, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to save a little bit of time here towards the end. I wanna give some time to Brian and Laura so that they can uh, go through their presentation and then at the end, we will have opportunity to um, do some questions and answering, or do some questions and answers if uh, we have time and not sure if we will or not. You guys gonna be over 30 minutes? Okay, so we'll probably have some time. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Brian Cowart, our Chief Development Officer, and Laura Rushi, our DAB 5K Series Manager. That's too advanced there. Which one? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to see some familiar and friendly faces. Uh, First, before I begin, uh, when Ed was telling the story about how I like motorcycles, what he didn't say is he, he did give me a blank check to get a motorcycle, but I didn't cash it because uh, Mark Burgess's name was at the top of it. So I didn't trust it. So if you get a check from Ed, make sure you check who it's from. Um, that being said, um, this afternoon, we wanna, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we have in place to... Um, help provide you guys with support and awareness in, in your states and your communities. Um, being a fundraiser myself and Laura being a fundraiser, we know how hard it is to raise funds um, out in the, the marketplace. It's a challenging environment. So we certainly want to help all of you in, in raising funds, providing you guys with funds, but also want to make it as easy as possible for you to raise money um, when you're out there. So 
If, if there's some way we can help you in doing that, we want to hear about it, please let us know. We do, we do take that back and um, try to come up with solutions to help you. So today we're going to touch on four areas. We're going to touch on our car donation program, which hopefully you guys know about. We're going to talk about the Just Be Kids program, because I know a lot of you are out there raising money for Just Be Kids and may have questions about that scholarship. We're going to talk about our 5K series, um, and we're also going to talk about the Ford Drive for Your Community program, which is an exciting program that we hope more of you guys take advantage of to, uh, to raise funds. So our car donation program, we started about a year ago. Um, it's a nationwide program, and since that program started, we've raised over $600,000 in just a year's time with over 2,200 cars donated. Um, the slide you're seeing here, these are the numbers for this year alone in just about six months. We've raised over uh, almost $500,000 and has netted uh, DAV almost $300,000. We're getting cars from almost every state. Um, I do want to remind you that a percentage of the proceeds from the cars donated to each state do go back, does go back to the department. And many um, of the uh, states that we're getting donations from are getting fairly large allocations. Um, some of the states are seeing allocations uh, back in, the, in excess of $10,000. Um, you can see the list of um, states that we've gotten cars from. The ones at the top, um, the top three, um, are really pushing uh, car donations in their states. So the more that that program is promoted, you can see the fruits of those labor, of their labor, and we really want to um, encourage you guys to, uh, to help us get the word out about the program, because um, it really is an easy way to, to raise funds uh, for your departments. Here's some of the ads that we do currently, um, mainly digitally to promote the program, as well as through our magazine. Um, we've also heard from you guys, and uh, last year there was a lot of questions about how, how can we get the word out. And so we've gone back. We have a toolkit right now that you can download from the membership portal that talks about the program, has all a bunch of answers to, uh, to questions in terms of, well, what cars can you donate? Um, we pretty much take any car, any car, any vehicle that moves, we take it. And even if it doesn't move, if you have a car that only has two wheels on it or you have to push to make it move, we'll take that. And, um, and it can be donated. Um, it has information about how you can promote it. We have flyers, we have brochures, um, emails that you can use uh, just to help get the word out about the program. We also have developed promotional items that you can order. You see those on the screen right now that you can order to promote the program um, as well. So we've really tried to make it as easy as possible for you to promote the program in your communities. Um, and uh, hopefully, it's really just a, a numbers game. The more we get, get the word out about the program, we're definitely seeing the fruits of that already. Um, so we hope uh, more of you will take advantage and, and help us get the word out about the, the car donation pro DAV's National Car Donation Program. Just Be Kids, uh, as you guys have heard and we're very proud of, DAV has been partnering and supporting Camp Corral since its inception. Uh, four or four years ago. And Camp Corral has really grown because of DAV's efforts. Um, but what we've tried to do over the last three years is really, number one, help it easier, make it easier for you to fundraise. But number two, make sure that you're doing it in a way that aligns with our bylaws and guidelines. When we first heard that many of you were out there raising funds for Camp Corral, what we realized is that many of you are actually giving the funds to Golden Corral directly, which was a big no-no. <laughs> um, per our bylaws and in, in, uh, Constitution bylaws, um, any money that is raised by someone who is representing DAV must be accounted for by DAV and used to support DAV programs. So you can't go out representing DAV, even if it's for a worthy cause. If you're raising money, you're representing DAV as if you're collecting money for DAV, you then can't turn around and say, give it to, to someone else who, even if they're doing good work, unless that money is first accounted for by DAV and is being used in some way to support a DAV program. 
So the Just Be Kids scholarship was created um, for that purpose, um, to allow you to raise funds, to account for those funds, and then give it back to uh, Camp Corral. Uh, we've been very pleased with the, with the success and how much uh, money we're seeing raised from the program over the last three or four years. It's increased every single year. Um, as was mentioned in the joint opening session this year, um, over $620,000 was given to Camp Corral through, through your efforts. Um, so we really, really appreciate it. And part of that is from the funds that you're raising, which from chapters and departments, there was roughly almost $240,000 raised across the country, and then national matched those funds dollar for dollar. So it basically makes your money go further by DAV's headquarters matching it. Also, I know many of you are working with Golden Corral stores to raise money, and I know they're very competitive, the stores, because they win incentives and prizes um, um, from the funds that are raised. And so also it's a very much a benefit to ensure that national matches those funds. So how do you make sure that happens? We also have a fundraising guide on the portal now for Just Be Kids that you can go out and download. It talks about um, how you go about fundraising for the Just Be Kids scholarship and for, for Camp Corral. On there is part of the fundraising guide. You can download this form that you're seeing up on the screen. It's the Just Be Kids form, and I get a ton of questions coming my way. I get a lot of calls where people are like, well, how do I send the money in? What do I do? How do I make sure the store gets credit? This form right here is what you should use when you're sending your money in for any funds that you've collected um, in support of Just Be Kids supporting Camp Corral. On here, you can put how much money was collected, when it was collected, what stores you were collecting it for, um, if you were collecting it for a store, which you don't have to, but you m must use this form if you want to have your funds matched by headquarters and if you want to ensure that any stores you're raising money for get credit for the funds raised for Just Be Kids. So that form is part of the guide. Also, we heard you loud and clear last year, and what, what we heard was, can you give us some tools to make it easier for us to raise funds Number one, we don't know about Just Be Kids and really what it's about fully, and how do we communicate to those who are donating to us about Just Be Kids and make it easy. So we went back, we created some materials, we now have a bucket that's branded Just Be Kids that you can, you can order to raise funds. We also have a flyer, which you see on the screen, which talks about Just Be Kids and how it supports Camp Corral. So if people are coming into stores or if you're standing somewhere collecting money, you can give them a flyer that talks about the program. So that's now part of the guide and you can order those as well. And there's instructions on how to do that as part of the guide. So we're very excited to, to now have that tool and resource for you guys who, uh, who are out there doing this fundraising for this great, this great camp for kids. This here is a list of all the chapters have departments that have raised funds over the last year um, for, for Just Be Kids. And like I said, it's just continued to grow every single year. And I know if Camp Corral was up here, they'd certainly be saying thank you to all of you. And um, there could be more because I still know that some of you are, I do, I hear from Camp Corral that some people are still sending money straight into either Camp Corral or they're sending it to Golden Corral. And again, I just want to encourage you um, to please make sure that you send those funds in to us so we can match those funds and also give you credit and make sure um, they, get, they get back to Camp Crowd in the right way. So now I'm going to turn it over to Laura, who's going to talk about uh, a couple of our other programs. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> so DAV 5K, how many of you by show of hands have been to a DAV 5K event before? Good, good number of you. So the DAV 5K, um, Executive Director Jesenowski mentioned a few remarks um, in the opening session today. Um, it is a run, walk, roll, ride, a motorcycle ride. Um, hosted by the DAV. We work with various departments across the country, um, all to raise awareness of our great organization and to bring um, families together to celebrate Veterans Day. Um, all of our events are held either the first or second weekend in November. Um, it's a unique experience to honor veterans. We have race bibs where you can write in the name of the veteran in your life that you're running for or walking for. Um, veterans all receive custom shirts if they choose to register that way where we'll put the branch of service on the back of their shirts. 
Um, we have motorcycle riders that take place, which creates a different level of energy for the runners and the motorcycle riders together. Um, and we always have a post party after the race to kind of celebrate and bring the community together. Um, so it started in 2013. We've been growing every year, um, traveling across the country, getting to work with lots of great departments. And last year we had five events with over 8,200 participants nationwide. And half of all of those participants were veteran themselves. Um, next year we'll be in six, six markets across the country. Um, and we can't wait. We hope, we hope to see you all there. Um, we had 80 sponsors in the series, so as Barry had mentioned today, a lot of our sponsors continue to come back. Um, they grow with us across the country, and they tend to get more involved with DAV by being a part of this great um, 5K series. Um, American Airlines was in Tulsa, Blue Line Rental was in Newport News, um, Luxottica was in Cincinnati, Panera Bread, Hankook, even Uber, Dominion Power were all new sponsors last year to the series, which we're really proud of. Um, even celebrities get involved, Coach Marvin Lewis of the Bengals, um, Coach Dan Quinn of the Falcons, they almost won the Super Bowl last year, um, and even Gary Sinise did PSAs all to support the 5K last year, and we had over a million dollars in earned media value, so we didn't pay for any of that media, but the value of all the media from the 5K series was pretty phenomenal across the country. Um, these are the dates for, for the next year, well, this year, in November. It's just a couple months away, if you can believe it. Um, so if you look up here and if you live close to any of these cities um, or you're friends with any of the department folks from these states, we'd love to have you come out and register and be a part of any of the, uh, these events across the series. Um, and to give you a little extra challenge, and I have flyers up here if you guys want to come and collect them. We actually have a member challenge this year, which is brand new, um, and so it's to encourage you um, as a member of the organization to get involved with the 5K. Um, so you can register for any of the events across the country, and we would love for you to come. Um, you can even register as a virtual participant if you know you can't come physically to one of those cities across the country, um, and we'll be competing against each other um, to see who can raise the most money um, and to see who can have the largest team. And so again, you can do this by physically being at the event or being a virtual participant at the event. And um, next year, um, we'll elect, um, like I said, the top fundraiser or the top team captain. Um, and the winners, the member winners, will receive a trip to national convention. And they will also receive an award on main stage at one of the opening sessions next year. So we hope that excites you and gets, gets you interested. Um, there's a flyer up here, and there's also more information and a memo from Mark Burgess that, that's on the membership portal as well. So we hope, we hope to see you guys participate. Another program that we have is Ford's Drive for Your Community. Um, if you guys have been through the exhibitor area downstairs, I know VDAC is there, um, Golden Corral was there today, and Ford is there as well. Um, so you can get more information from those, those folks down there as well. But Drive for Your Community, we've been participating for a few years now, um, and this is a way for you to raise money for your department or for your chapter. Um, it is a test drive um, event, so you would definitely want to um, connect with one of your local dealerships in town um, and see if they were interested in hosting um, you know, this event at the dealership. Um, this can run any time during the year, um, so it can, depending on the weather, right, you know, people might not want to come out when it's snowing to test drive vehicles, but um, the idea is that we, you know, work with a local dealership and you guys go out and kind of recruit family, friends, and your network to come in, and for every test drive that's driven on that particular event day, Ford will donate $20. Um, the maximum donation you can receive is up to, it looks like $6,000, um, and we've had some chapters have pretty good luck with this. Um, we do have a toolkit in the membership portal. Um, that toolkit is similar where it'll have kind of all the ins and outs, all the instructions on how to get started. Um, it'll give you links to different web forms that you can fill out to submit your event request. Um, it will all, all also have um, incentives, so if you want to order a banner, or if you want to order posters or things like that, it's also included in the toolkit. Um, Ford is downstairs. They do have some drive for your community information, so I would encourage you to go down and talk to them. Um, and it's definitely something that you guys can do um, to directly raise money um, for your local initiatives. 
Um, this is our slide that shows progress to date. So, um, you know, in the past we started, we had a couple in 2005 and we've been growing this a little bit every year. Um, and so, so far this year we've actually been raising more money than we did last year. And on average of all the states up there, they're on average raising about $3,000 per event. Um, and again, a lot of that is just about networking to, to get lots of family and friends and community involved so that the more test drives you have, the more, the more funds that you can raise. And this last is a screenshot of the member portal. So as you guys are probably very familiar, um, if you go to our website, dev.org, and you type in your membership number, um, this is the membership resource page. And we just kind of highlighted a little bit to show you all the things that Brian and I talked about. Um, there's more information there that you can download. And that's it. Thank you. And if I would just say one thing on the Ford Drive for Your Community, for those few chapters that have taken advantage of this, they tell us that that's the easiest $3,000 they have ever raised. So please, uh, you know, look into it because um, it's really an easy way to raise a lot of money. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, at, this, at this time, we've got about uh, 11 minutes for any questions that you may have, whether it's for me or Brian or Laura. I would ask, though, if you do have questions, please um, come up to the microphone for the benefit of everyone who is still in attendance. Okay, 11 minutes. There are like 25 people coming up. <laughs> All right. For Brian, for, on, for fundraising. Hold on a second. Please does, keep it down, please, so we can the, hear. Disabled American veterans have any kind of liability insurance for fundraisers? No. And, um, well, hey, Brian, his question was, D does DAV have any liability in terms of fundraisers? So in typical fundraisers, no, it would be responsible. It would be the responsibility of the chapter of the department to get the appropriate uh, liability insurance for the fundraiser. I'm not sure if they have anything specific for Drive for Your Community. For Drive, drive for Your Community, all the liability falls on Ford. So if you do that event, DEV has no liability, all that liability, they have all the insurance. Okay, good. And when, when people test drive for the Ford Drive for Your Community, they sign a waiver as well, and Ford pr provides all that information. Okay, because I've tried to get insurance, and I can't get insurance. Please keep it down if you're leaving, please, so we can hear. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doug Boyd, uh, Commander of Chapter 1, Woodward Wilson and Raleigh, North Carolina. Two questions. Uh, what about bonding for the treasurer, those people that need that, that to handle the money within the chapter? And number two, talk to us about 501c3 versus c4, as far as donations are concerned, okay. that are identified as tax exempt. Gotcha. Um, so bonding for a treasurer falls under that director and officer policy that I talked about earlier. So there are many different names for it, a DNO policy or a bonding policy. They're all really one and the same, but it allows the chapter or the entity to identify which officers of the chapter and primarily any entity that's responsible for handling money should be included in that DNO or that bonding policy. So they're really one and the same. The second question with regard to the differences between a 501c3 and a 501c4, Obviously, most people identify a 501c3 as being a tax-exempt organization. Typically, 501c4 organizations are not tax-exempt unless you have a special determination letter from the Internal Revenue Service that allows you to be tax-exempt. All DAV entities are 501c4s. We also have that letter of um, determination from the Internal Revenue Service that allows us to be tax-deductible. And the reason that we're a C4 versus a C3 primarily is it allows us to be very active legislatively, which is one of our main core aspects of the organization, in addition to providing services, we lobby uh, Congress and the White House for benefits that are, are beneficial to veterans and their families. So that's why we're a C4 which is also tax exempt versus a C3. C3s are not uh, usually permitted to do any lobbying on Capitol Hill. 
So there's a document that the chapters can use to get. Yes, um, uh, we have that document readily available. So if you have donors uh, that want to provide a grant to you, um, we can certainly, and, and we provide it at we provide it uh, at least once or twice a year. That letter of determination that validates that your chapter, chapter number one, is a tax exempt organization. So you can provide that to your donor. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. And if you need that, just give us a call at National Headquarters. We can get it to you. Yes, sir. You ready for me, Ed? Two questions, one for the IG and one for Brian. Okay. First one on the, uh, for the IG, you mentioned about credit cards, not necessary. You were kind of like, could you give us like some more, like, don't do it. You yeah. know, it, 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 there's, there's, that's why there's some confusion out yeah. there because well, the way that thing is written, well, and, not good. We don't want to tie the hands of DAV entities. We don't want to be big brother. We don't want to micromanage DAV entities. So there are certainly chapters, there are certainly departments that, that may have a true justifiable need for a credit card. So we don't want to say carte blanche, you can't have them. But for... A majority of DAV entities, they're really not necessary and really could potentially lead to some problems. Okay. That's why, it's, that's why it doesn't say they're prohibited. They're really discouraged. And, you know, I wouldn't do that because I'm a Marine and I'm pretty honest. <laughs> Brian, one for you. The com we had confusion with this Just Be Kids. When, we, when I went down from Chapter 22 in Portsmouth, Golden Corral called us and asked us to come on down. And I thought we had an agreement that at the end of the, uh, the uh, fundraiser that we would, they would write a check to us and we would send it to National. And they said, no, this was a separate fundraiser. So a lot of us didn't know that. And the, here's the problem for most, for, for, for like our chapter and probably other chapters. We were there from April till like the 10th of June to do Camp Corral fundraising, and then we're going back in September to do military appreciation from you know, uh, Labor Day till November. So how do we work in a Just Be Kids and the Golden Corral who also wants us to support them? Or do we go, can we go to somebody else besides Golden Corral to do the Just Be Kids? Yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um... You do not have to work with Golden Corral to do Just Be Kids. Just Be Kids is a DAV scholarship, and we can raise money anywhere and any how we want to. Um, now, we do know that a lot of stores have relationships with you guys, and so they call you and say, hey, come in and raise money for us. And they're doing that because they get incentives, like free trips mm -hmm. and things like that. So you're doing them a big favor by going into those stores. They also now know that your funds are matched which their funds are not, which is another reason why they want you to come into their stores, which we're fine with that. Again, but the only, the only caveat is if you're in those stores raising money, those funds must go back to us in order for them to be matched. I also know that they're doing their own fundraising at the register, sometimes when we're also in those stores. And that what I'm hearing is sometimes they're giving us that money. We cannot take that money, number one, we didn't raise the money. It's always about what is the individual's intent. If the individual's intent was to donate to DAV, we have to take the funds. At the register, their intent is to donate to Camp Corral. Those people at the register, those, the Golden Corral staff, are not saying, hey, donate to DAV. They're saying donate to Camp Corral. So we can't take that fund, those funds, because then they would be doing a misuse of those funds. So. You have to be clear, and I've talked to our, our Golden Corral friends to say, you, they have to get the word out to their staff that says, if you're doing fundraising for Camp Corral, those funds cannot come to DAV. The only funds that DAV can account for are the funds that we specifically raise. And if they tell you otherwise, tell them you can't do it. Yeah, it was a little confusing because when you went to the link, it says it's a DAV Golden Corral sponsored event. So some of us thought that the money was come to us. But that's my question, and I wanted to tell Laura that she's doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Paul Harris with Chapter 901, Decatur, Joy. Same, uh, 
Now, we go out and collect this money at Golden Corral, so that big bucket we have at the end of the day, we supposed to, what we do with that money? You need to take it back to your chapter and deposit it, and then use this form and write a check to DAV headquarters with the instructions that are on the form to send it in to us. And on the form, you can also put the store number that you, where you raised the money at. It's so, that simple. So we, at the end of the day, do not give them that do bucket? Do not give them the money. Do not. Okay. That is money that should was donated to DAV, so we need to account for those funds. And that's another thing that gets you in trouble with the Internal Revenue Services, because DAV is a tax-exempt organization. Camp Corral is also a nonprofit tax organization, so we can't raise money for other nonprofit organizations. So we can't go in as a DAV entity and say, hi, you know, we're here from DAV Chapter 9. We're raising money for Camp Corral. Camp Corral, Golden Corral is the store entity, Camp Corral is the nonprofit entity of it that is raising the money for Camp Corral. Because we raised like tw uh, this past year over twelve thousand dollars from two store from two stores. But another question is that um, in our chapter Constitution bylaws, we have a clause in there stating that the commander get two hundred dollars a month for her expense. Do they have to? file the 1099 for that $200? Yes. If, um, and again, the magic number is $600. $600. So if you get over $600 during the course of the year, a 1099 has to be issued. Okay. Because they have to pay tax on it. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. Craig Vance, Chapter 66, Oklahoma. Can you explain the parameters under which a chapter can promote their fundraising events poker run, raffle, pancake dinner, whatever it is, on social media? They can simply indicate on social media, whether it's by way of Facebook, Twitter, um, whatever, whatever the social media is, even on the chapter's own website, that, hey, chapter, I'm sorry, is it 66? Yes. Or six, 66 is having a pancake breakfast or a poker run on this date. Uh, come out and join us. That's it. You can't make any appeal for, you can't ask for donations, you can't provide a link for any registration or any other mechanism to raise funds, but you can only simply say, we're having this event, this is when it is, you know, come be a part of it. But there can't be any method that allows for an individual to submit funds, pay registration, or anything else. So nor on a can poker you, run or a raffle, you can't say right. how much the ticket is? You no. can just say, give a phone number for more information or something like that? You, you could do that. You could do that. But you can't do anything that, that is an appeal for money. You can't ask for money online. Okay. You could just say, for more information, contact this phone number. Okay. Thanks. Okay. You're welcome, Craig. Yes, my name is James Austin, commander from Chapter 21, Durham, North Carolina. I have a very simple question. Uh, it was stated that you could not make a loan or grant to another organization, but uh, it is okay to make a donation to a, another organization, such as the city stand down. It is okay to do that. Absolutely. And we have, we have to be very careful. I mean, because we as an organization, when we raise money from the general public, we do so in the name of DAV with the promise that we're going to support disabled veterans and their families. So um, where we find ourselves getting in trouble is when a chapter or a department makes a donation to American Legion or VFW because they need to put a new roof on their building. That's really hard to justify that we're spending our money on service to veterans and their families. But in the same token, if VFW or the American Legion is hosting a stand down or some other group is hosting a stand down that's gonna benefit disabled veterans and their families, we can validate, justify that donation all day long. That that part of our donation, even though it went to another organization, was used specifically for veterans and their families. Yes, sir, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. Deb Bolson, Department of Massachusetts. Question is 360 in financial reports, is that going to happen anytime in the near future, or is that like a two-year project? Well, you know what, that's a very good question. Did you come to the membership seminar earlier? Yes, I was, so I was asking, okay. they had, they said 19 for membership, is are we on the same 
time schedule for financial reports as well. I would, I would venture to see, because that kind of falls under the realm of membership because all those financial reports come into the membership system um, or to the membership department for review. So if they told you 19, that's probably when it's going to be fully uh, okay. So if I wanted to talk to somebody about pretty much how that 360 is going to work on financial reports, I should speak to somebody in membership. Absolutely, yep. And either find Doug Wells or Robin Higgins. Ape, um, would April be a better source for that since she's um, the one that handles the financial reports? Probably not. No. Uh, I mean, especially if you wanted an answer at this convention right. while you're here talk to either Doug or Robin, okay. or if when you get back, you can either call Doug or Robin or maybe even call April. April's not here at the right. convention. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thank Tom Walrab, Inspector General for the State of New York. Ed, uh, what do you see the role of the in Inspector General as investigative or watchdog or proactive or reactive? Should they be on every committee to make sure everything's being followed? Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, my role uh, as the National Inspector General is to protect and preserve the good name of the organization, and that is really all-inclusive. That includes ensuring that all of our departments, even the national organization, the departments and chapters are following uh, the Constitution and bylaws, uh, ensuring that the use of the logo is appropriate in all cases, um, overseeing fundraising activities. So in your role at the department level, certainly it's both reactive and proactive. I, and, and the more proactive you are, the less reactive you have sure. to be. Um, so it's really a matter of just understanding that and, and, and maybe even trying to communicate with each of the chapters and the departments that, you know, hey, I'm here to help. If you have a question with regard to your constitution and bylaws, feel free to reach out to me. Now that puts an extra burden on you to not only know the department's bylaws and the national bylaws, but maybe even that particular chapter's bylaws. Um, typically though, in most departments, uh, it's a matter of conducting an investigation. So if there's a chapter issue that, that the department commander has identified, you know, that uh, uh, there's some, there appears to be something, some irregularities within their financial report, I'd like for you to go in and look at their bank statements, their meeting minutes to make sure that their uh, uh, checkbook matches what the expenses are, what the income is, uh, make sure that the minutes of the meeting validate that yes, they approve this expenditure, so on and so forth. So it's really, it's really broad. I, I, I give the example all the time that I never know on any given day what I'm going to have to deal with. It's not anything that's really written in stone, but it could be any myriad of things. A follow-up to that, if you receive a complaint, do you have to get approval to do the investigation? Or yes. You do? Yeah, so um, as the department inspector, um, you're under the, just like I am, I'm under the, uh, adjutant. the, the, the adjutant and the uh, national commander and work for them. If they have identified a problem, you know, they will instruct me to go out and um, interview, conduct an investigation, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But but certainly, as you, if you identify things, you can certainly bring it to their attention, but it would require them to tell you, go ahead and move forward with it. And last question, we're five minutes late. Great. You're Becky perfect. Smith, Chapter 45, Clarksville, Tennessee, Commander. Want to have a yard sale, it's a fundraiser. Want to post it on Facebook. I'm not asking for money, I'm asking for a donation of items. That's okay, right? Um... Isn't that a great question? Yeah, yeah. See, I, I mean, I, I would, I would say, I would say yes. Yes. Um, because you're not asking for cash. You're not competing for funds. And, and somebody that lives, you know, 50 miles away, more than likely isn't going to drive all the way to the chapter to drop items off for the fund. They may or may they may not. But the intent is obviously that. When you do a fundraiser online, by virtue of the internet and the, and the, uh, the, the World Wide Web, you are appealing to people well outside your chartered territory to support your chapter in, uh, it's Clarksville, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, that the intent of the bylaws is, is chapters are chartered to operate in a very particular area. Um, you have to stay within those boundaries. Uh, that creates problems with other chapters because now you've got chapters that it might be in Oklahoma or California or in, in Louisiana saying, you know, hey, you know, 
chapter 45 in Clarksville, Tennessee is appealing to donations right. in our area, our chartered area. Right. So if it's for so donated says, goods, right. yeah. yeah, anything that deals with a direct appeal for cash is strictly prohibited, but if it's something like that and somebody's willing to drive 100 miles to drop off some, some goods for your yard sale, that's, I don't see a problem with that. Good to go. Thank you. All right.